She's a world leader in bioinformatics, an interdisciplinary field that develops methods and software tools for understanding biological data. She led a team that used DNA sequencing to determine that the Ebola virus was spreading from human to human, not from mosquitoes or other animals. She was named by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people and also a person of the year for her work as an Ebola fighter. She is the recipient of Smithsonian Magazine's American Ingenuity Award. Delegates, please give a huge hero's welcome to Dr. Pardis Sabeti. Hey. Thank you. Wow. Good morning. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Awesome. Wow, I love the energy. Well, thank you so much. I think last time I was in this uh, arena, I was watching No Doubt perform, so it's kind of fun to be here now uh, talking about something very, very different. Um, well, exciting to meet a lot of inspire, aspiring uh, doctors, physicians, clinicians, scientists. Um, I'm really, uh, uh, yeah, moved by this amazing energy in this room. I'm going to talk to you today about the work I do, um, trying to find ways to transform the way that we respond to outbreaks in an era where we have so much technology, and in particular the kind of technology I work on, which is genomics. In the latter part of the 20th century, or throughout the 20th century, but, but a really percolating in that latter part, we started to see so many different viruses emerging around the world. From Zika in 1947 to um, Ebola in 1976, uh, Marburg in 1967, HIV in the 1980s, we were just seeing them popping up all over. And it was really concerning, and it led the Institute of Medicine to publish a landmark paper uh, called Emerging Infections, Microbial Threats to Health in the United States. Uh, and in it, they really coined that term emerging disease as diseases that were new or rare to the human population that they believed were coming about because of the increasing world population, animal encroachment, the connectivity around the world, uh, there's this sense that viruses were on the rise. And we thought that when we see them, it was you know, in this like, very dramatic way that we'd be aware when these viruses are coming out of the forest or through contact with human, animal products, and that we would know when these pandemics are rising. But my group began to think sometime a few years ago that the true face of the emerging disease is much more quiet. It's a village somewhere uh, with a sort of a, 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 a child that's not feeling well, that's something that's going under our noses. And we began to think about that not actually in the field originally, but by mining data from the human genome. So you guys live in an amazing era where there's so much data all around us. And rather than have to go and painstakingly collect a number of data, you can just mine all of the available data out there and find patterns. And what I did in my PhD was to look for a footprint, a footprint that gets left behind when humans are trying to survive the environment, infectious diseases, and beyond, when there's what we call evolutionary pressure. A new mutation might emerge in the population, and as it rises in prevalence, it takes with it a chunk of the genome. And that leaves a signature we can pick up to pinpoint what changes were important. Thousands and thousands of changes over time that essentially made us who we are. And as we were looking in the human genome, running a scan of populations around the world, the single strongest signal that we found in our first scan was linked to a disease called Lassa fever. And I had gone to medical school, I never heard about it. And so um, I was sort of trying to think, how is this disease I've never even heard about that's described as an emerging disease, such a strong pressure on human populations? Well, we know it's devastating. It's a lot like Ebola. It causes frank hemorrhage and very high fatality rates that can be over 50%. We know it's spread by rodents, and it can be in a lot of different places. But again, it was first discovered in 1969 as this new fever virus. So how was it driving ancient evolution? Well, we f looked for that the only way we could, by going out into villages, uh, working in Sierra Leone in Nigeria. We went to investigate 
what was going on? What was this virus that I hadn't heard of that was such a potential strong driver of our ancient history? Um, and so we set up clinics and worked with our partners there to set up the capacity to do that kind of work. And what we started to find is the importance of the loop, a virtuous loop, where we didn't just go out and try to get others to help us with our discoveries. We used the technologies we had to discover new things, but then we then took those discoveries to create tools that we could go back to our international partners with, helping them. As we found better diagnosis, we'd put them into the clinics. We started to realize the more we help them, the more they're engaged and the communities are empowered, the more we start to discover. And over time, we started seeing patients like this that we were first able to diagnose for the first time in Nigeria where we were working and with our partners in Sierra Leone helping the efforts they had. And even though cases did come in like this, where you might say something is going on, this patient is very, very ill, the vast majority of the patients that came into the clinic had very nonspecific symptoms. You wouldn't have been able to pick up that they had something more than malaria or dengue or some of the classic things going around. You wouldn't have known they were carrying a biosafety level 4 virus, much like Ebola. And as we started mining the literature, we started seeing evidence from many different angles through all, all of the work that others had done. We started putting it together and we said, actually, the evidence is suggesting this virus is circulating. It's circulating widely. And as we started looking at the virus itself, tracking its history, we started seeing evidence in the genome of the virus that it's probably been around for thousands of years. And so that changed the picture for us a little bit. And we coined this term emerging uh, we, we asked this question, emerging disease or diagnosis? Were these diseases that we thought were circulating, uh, that were coming up to high prevalence very, very quickly, had they actually been around for a long time, and was this just new detection of viruses that had long been circulating? And this is a picture of the Ebola virus drawn into the Congo River by the first author, Stephen Geyer, of this paper, to suggest that if we looked from a different angle, would we recognize these viruses have been there for all time? And just as we started thinking about that and saying, OK, well, we have to do better to pick these things up where they lie before they become pandemics, one hit. Uh, in March of 2014, the Ebola outbreak uh, hit Guinea. It first declared there, likely even been circulating for before that time. Uh, but we knew that Guinea was on the border of Sierra Leone and Liberia, close to where we worked. And that if the outbreak was to come into the country, into Sierra Leone or into Nigeria, where our partners are, we would probably be the first to pick it up. So our team went out to uh, here, shown in Sierra Leone, and set up those diagnostics with our partners in the hospital there. They were already doing diagnosis. We were just helping them set up the diagnostic test for Ebola. And they began to do that surveillance um, through March and in April and through May. And in late May, they, Augustine Goba pictured here, ran this gel that confirmed the first case of Ebola in Sierra Leone. And we talk about that case, it was exactly what you'd want to see. The hospital picked it up right away, they had the diagnostics to do it, the patient was isolated, treated safely, no one else was infected, and they were cared for. And if it was the first case, that would have been fine. But the problem was already the outbreak had surpassed all outbreaks previously. And it didn't come into Sierra Leone as an individual case, but like a tidal wave. Hundreds of cases within a matter of weeks were piling in. The thing was spreading out of control. We did everything we could to help the communities there and to draw national attention. We didn't do very well. Just our sort of screaming, there's a problem here, wasn't working. So we did the one thing we could do as scientists, is we partnered together and we sequenced the virus and we released that data as fast as we could within a matter of weeks. We generated 99 genomes of the virus that was able to give us the many different insights. And this is just a picture of the Ebola virus genome and all of these mutations that were happening just in a matter of weeks. And it lets you know these viruses, it's not like one virus coming after us, it's changing in all time. We've never given it so many opportunities to transmit from human to human. And the kinds of things, the insights you can get by looking at genomic data is we could begin to see by looking at the family tree of those viruses that they had come into the human population only once. And from there, we're transmitting from human to human. And that changed in a large way the way we were reacting to it. Before, most of the public health announcements were stay away from bats, stay away from monkeys, stay away from mangoes or other uh, fruit that were touched by animals. But then later, it changed dramatically 
to really a focus on hand washing and contact tracing. And so these are the kinds of things we can do when we understand how the virus is operating. It's also really important to understand the genome of a virus because fundamentally the diagnostics, the vaccines, the therapies we use against them are based on that genome sequence. And all of us together, collectively, with that data released, can all be working. And I, I saw high school students across the country reaching out to me, building their own you know, do-it-yourself diagnostics. That's what we need if an outbreak hits. We need every single good mind, good heart working on the problem. Um, we also can begin to see if the virus is mutating. And later, uh, our group, along with a number of other great scientists around the world, we're able to show that one of the mutations that happened early in the outbreak, right as the outbreak really took off, changed the way the virus operates. It made it more infective, and it did so in a way that made it better to do so in humans and not in other mammals. So humans and primates, not other mammals. So what we're seeing is actually, it looks like the virus was adapting, adapting to transmit from human to human even better. So that was a very stark realization, and it tells us how important it is that we act swiftly. And that is the kind of work that we can do through genomics, um, detect these so-called emerging pathogens, improve diagnostics and treatments, track transmission and hotspots, because viruses will keep coming, even ones that we've seen before. Again, Zika was first diagnosed in 1947, but it came onto the scene as it started spreading through the Americas, and of course caught our attention because of the way that it infects pregnant mothers, can cross the placenta and affect the, the life of the child, that she's carrying, causing microcephaly. And so we did, we, you know, first we didn't actually work in this outbreak. We weren't sure if we had a part to play, but quick, quickly realized we must. And so we partnered with groups around the world. We got, uh, collected Zika samples from 10 different countries and were able to once again work as a team to sequence the virus and get insights. And the key insights we found about Zika was we could see that it originally started to escalate in Brazil, then seeded out into the Caribbean, and then through at least five different introductions and possibly over 40 introductions came into Florida. So it was coming into the United States. And what was frightening about this is actually that we saw it in 10 different countries, and we could date when the virus, the genomics lets us date when the virus enters a country, and we could see in each case the virus was circulating long before, many, many months before we ever picked it up. And so this is how these outbreaks happen under our nose. And of course, diagnosis is critically important here when, again, you're talking about anxious pregnant mothers who are wondering whether or not their child will be infected, whether or not they got Zika, even in Florida, even in the United States. In fact, every state in the United States has seen cases, um, at least traveler cases, coming in. And so we realized that the genome sequence can allow us to very quickly update our diagnostics and make them much, much better. By seeing where the changes happen in the genome, we can make more sensitive diagnostics to help those mothers. We also are now working uh, with Feng Zhang in his lab to develop CRISPR-based diagnostics. And you've you know, likely heard a lot about that revolution that's happening. Well, that revolution can also help us at atomolar sensitivity, pick up viruses in our blood, and also use them to cut the virus and disable them as therapies. And that's the kind of work that we can do. We want to work end to end, working all the way in the clinic, creating those tools and then bringing them back. And there's much, much work to be done. In my own lab, we work on Lassa virus. Mumps, as the outbreaks are, if you, you know, when you go college campuses are breeding gowns for mumps and other viruses. Um, and we see a lot of that happening. Uh, chikungunya and other mosquito-borne infections, Powassan and other tick-borne infections. I mean, these things are all on the rise. The tick populations, if you're out and about, are higher than they've ever been because of the warm winter that we had. Uh, so watch yourself. Um, it, all of these things are on the rise and need to be paid attention to. We work towards, sorry, this is like not a scare you in every way. There will be a positive sign at the end, I promise. <laughs> um, uh, but we're working, and because of that, we're working on global and local surveillance efforts to make sure that within country, we have every level of detection. Within our campus, we're working with Harvard University to create better detection of anything circulating on that campus. We can do a lot better working collectively. Um, all of the work I'm describing here is done by this amazing collective of individuals in my lab and the collaborators that we work with. Uh, this is just a, ho a holiday card we had from 2016. Um, but you can see that the type of work we do is really 
challenging and difficult, but it has to be done creatively and with love and with energy because it's incredibly challenging work. There's no other way to do that. Um, and it has to, you know, and we're just one part. We play one part in this whole process, and everyone must play a part. We work with mass design firm and architecture, um, IMC and partners in health and clinical care, Fathom and data analytics, amazing groups from field applications, the training that we do on site uh, at Harvard to help our collaborators around the world, um, and outreach. We have to all work collectively. If an outbreak is to come, it's going to require not it's not going to be solved if we're all fighting each other you know, in grocery stores, like punching each other for vegetables or you know, canned food. It's going to be solved by working in unison. Um, and with that, I just want to end with a thought. Um, and then I really want to get into the Q&As, which is always my most fun part. Um, so this is just a picture of me in 2009 when I went out to Ni Nigeria for one of the first times I was, I was visiting out there. I had, I was, I'm a musician, so this is actually why this is also really interesting to be here. Um, I'm a musician, and I um, had a big show coming up after a three-week visit to Nigeria. I brought my guitar, and, um, and I was practicing outside of the clinic where we work and realized actually the girls uh, had much better voices than I did. And in fact, actually, every morning they would sing. They would start the day by singing before they went into the clinic to diagnose loss of fever and to treat patients with this devastating disease. They began every day singing. And so we actually started singing together. And bit by bit, every year after I came back, we would sing, we would write, and they would come to visit us in the summer, and we would do the same thing. And in 2014, when a group of them were out visiting us, in Boston was right in the midst of the Ebola outbreak. And we had made this pact with ourselves that we would always get together every Sunday and sing and write. And it's kind of a strange thing to do in the midst of an outbreak and seem like, I mean, I was, we, I, we weren't sleeping. So how is it that we came to do this? Well, we had just made this commitment. We'd actually recorded the music for uh, some different kinds of music and booked a studio that we were going to go rec do recording in. So we said, let's just see what happens. And one day, amidst the Ebola outbreak, we learned, we just learned that two of our nurses had come down with Ebola, and Dr. Humar Khan, pictured here, had just been diagnosed with Ebola. And we'd gotten together to sing, thinking, why are we doing this in the midst of all of this chaos? And the group of us girls, we sat around the room um, uh, with my guitar player, Bob, uh, playing music, and we picked up this one tune that I had had in the back of my head. We had tried a bunch of other songs. Nobody wanted to sing them. And there's just this one tune that I had. And I actually didn't think I was going to sing this, and I didn't practice. But the simple thing I kept saying, very, very simple, over and over again, and I might have you guys do it just to make me feel better, is, uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Can you guys do that? I'm gonna make you do it. All right, here we go. Ready? Uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, 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 yeah, 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 uh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and out of that came this song. I'm only gonna play you a 30 second clip. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I honestly, I, I haven't practiced at all, so I apologize. I was very pitchy, but we're going to. Um, but here's just the end of the song that we wrote that day, where we, we sat there in that room wondering what we were doing, why were we there, what is our existence, what does life mean. Days later, Dr. Khan died. But the one thing we had is this connectivity with each other and this understanding that no matter how bad the situation gets, we only get through it together in this moment in the fight that we have. Um, and here is the clip of this song.
the, the line that it says there, that whole song was just written in that one session, and it talks about how we stream, we dream, we strive, our hunger will never die, and I'm always in this fight with you. And I felt like I was always in that fight with Dr. Com. And the song ends with, I spent a lifetime for one truth, that I'm alive and so are you. We are here, we are the proof. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Let's do a photo. Okay, so. All right, here. guys. All right, photo of me. I'm doing it this time, so it's going to work. Up. One, two, three. <laughs> Boom. All right, let's bring Jack Andreka back up here. Hey, Jack. Jack, Good Jack, Jack. Good. Nice All right, give it up for Jack. You can right. sit right here. Okay. We'll so put, I'll, give you, I'll take that. Thank you. Perfect. All right, Jack. Okay. One more time. Hey. So you brought up a lot of really amazing points to that, that talk. And one of the coolest points that I thought was the local contacts that you established. And so I wanted to have you maybe speak a little bit on how important are local contacts in doing this type of international health, like international genomics type of research? Sure. Um, well, they're essential. Uh, there's no way. We, we wrote a paper once that said, you know, you have to create roots, not parachutes. You can't just come in and try to take um, information or do science without engaging the partners that you have. People try it all the time, and then they get frustrated because they say, well, nothing's happening, or they're not invested. You have to have everyone invested. And so <laughs> just fundamentally from the from the standpoint of getting work done, it doesn't work if not all partners are engaged in the right way. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I mean, that's the best part of my job, yeah. right? I mean, why would you not want to do that? I love the time that I spend in Africa uh, and in places around the world. Um, I love engaging with the communities there, and it's really fun. And the more we, the, the longer we spend together, the more it builds. And we're part of a collective drive. I and mean, if you're in these situations, if you're studying deadly viruses too, you have to have complete faith, trust, and love for every person that you're working with. And so that only works if you work in that kind of partnership. And you have a really interesting background, because you also have like a master's in biological anthropology. Mm -hmm. And so, how important is that type of training in your, like, medical research? Um, I mean, I th it's been valuable. So I ended up basically, I think I have, so a master's in biological anthropology, a PhD in genetics, and an MD. So I've definitely done a lot of education, and I don't think that everyone should just do so many degrees, but I love them all. And, um, and, and obviously, like, each of them play an important part. Thinking about a lot of the master's work was what got me thinking about human evolution, uh, but I was always passionate about medicine, so I, it was interesting the places it took me. It took me down my own unique path. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for everybody. Everyone finds what are the things that they gravitate to. So I'm not suggesting anyone should get as many degrees as, um, or you know, I'm just suggesting everyone fi finds the things they find interesting, mm -hmm. and it'll take them down that path. Awesome. And also, at the same time, you have this really interesting like, uh, interdisciplinary approach to genetics, where you do both the computational and the statistics part of genetics, but also the whole biological aspect. And so how did you kind of come to that kind of interdisciplinary like, approach? Mm -hmm. And what importance do you think these interdisciplinary approaches have in creating these new breakthroughs? Um, so like interdisciplinary is such a kind of like uh, everyone loves to say it's interdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary. I'm not, I mean, frankly, ultimately, like a lot of times in your education, it's really important to get a true education in one thing. You want to be an expert in one thing. You don't want to be too interdisciplinary. You want to master, you know, mechanical engineering and lock it down. You want to know what you know and know it very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, but then from there, it's really nice to come from your deep expertise and bridge to other groups. So my group has physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, public health experts, MDs. They're all coming with a unique background, but when you work together collectively, you can solve the problems. And we chose to be a lab that works end to end. We're in the clinics all the way you know, to the kind of release of data and beyond and biological insights. So we really require that interdisciplinary, but you don't have to, it's the part you wanna play. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, another aspect in your talk that you kind of brought up was this uh, kind of 
trend of emerging diseases. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of these uh, kind of new trends in like global warming and climate change, how is that tying into the emergence of these new infectious diseases? And how can we kind of consider that in our new like public health approaches? All of those things are going to be factors. Um, it, the, the fact that we had a warm summer this year means that the tick populations are up. Um, and those tick populations happen to have a lot of Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease. And those things are all going to change. And so we do see new things coming on the rise. But as I said before, all of the, a lot of the things that are new are old as well. They've been around for a long time. So the better we understand the landscape, the better off we'll be. Of course, all of these shifting patterns are going to make new precarious things and uh, unexpected things happen. That's what we have to watch for. And how are you going to see machine learning and AI and all these new computational techniques that are kind of coming out, how are you going to see those increasingly influencing medicine? And what role do you think the doctor will play when those come in to medical practice and mainstream? Sure. Um, so uh, absolutely, we should use a lot more data in medicine. Um, the fact of the matter is like, we're not leveraging it in any way that we should. Most of the time you go into your doctor and he kind of uses his experience, the few cases he's seen, he writes the diagnosis on the back of an envelope, he thinks about it. You should just be able to scan that, right? You should be able to say, these symptoms, this area, if it, particularly infectious disease, like this, these are the things circulating, these are the symptoms you have, you have a 20% probability of this, a 10% probability of that. We ran this test, it matches that. We should get to that point. And so I have a lot of machine learning folks in my lab developing apps to to, to understand networks to get users the best information. So what type of training and what type of uh, activities could high schoolers be doing to kind of get involved in this kind of bioinformatics, which is really becoming this dominant field in medicine? Um, I mean, I think that the better that, for the, if to work in my lab, I think skills that would be really necessary is a lot of mathematics, a lot of statistics, um, and CS. Um, mm -hmm. as much as you can go, um, yeah. Awesome, and a couple of other questions that we got from the audience was, how exactly did you, like, because you had this very interesting journey to where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And so what really led you to kind of hook on to this new trend of computational techniques and what led you to kind of hook on to that data in medicine? What really attracted you to that? Um, it's really important, actually, when you're choosing what you want to do with your life, actually, that you really think about your personality and your innate, what you innately enjoy. Not necessarily like what external drivers you have. Uh, there's a lot of external drivers that will take you to medicine for many reasons. Medicine was not a life for me. I, I knew that I always look li liked looking at data, mm -hmm. and I always like looking at math. And so I actually kept going into medicine, but I kind of kept booted out of it because it didn't quite fit my personality. Um, mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, it actually is what speaks to you is the driver, and I just love data. So what's the next most cool thing coming out of your lab? Can, can you give us a sneak peek into the new cool things that are out there? Sure. Um, so I'll tell you a few uh, things you might expect and then one you might not expect. So um, we're doing a lot of work with CRISPR and, and basically using CRISPR to develop, as I was noticed, noting, to ve develop really, really sensitive diagnostics, really, really sensitive therapies. We're creating apps that allow you to find out very quickly what's, imagine that you left here and you got sick and you wondered, like, what do I have? You go on your own personal medical odyssey. Well, what if the app could tell you actually everybody in Sangha Serena, 10 people had your symptoms. Um, actually, three of them got diagnosed with mumps. Maybe you should get checked out for mumps, right? Why are we not doing this more collectively? So we have a, a team of folks that are developing apps as well as um, information systems to use those to give you best predictions of your sickness. Um, and then one thing I'll just note, because I actually think it's really important to keep an open mind of any place you'll go, uh, is that uh, sitting out in the front row is Bob Cooley, uh, who came with me today. And Bob actually is probably my next big project I'd want to work on. I, um, I had a very serious accident. I actually met Bob before my accident, but I had a very serious accident two years ago where I completely shattered my pelvis and both my knees. So just totally blew them out. I, I'm, I have 39 rods and plates in my body. I'm an X Games type of a person. Uh, if you go to my Instagram, which is Pardis Savetti on Instagram, my first post was four months after my accident, was just my pelvis and my knees, just to show you this is who I am. 
And at that point, I suffered a really serious concussion, and I thought I'd never come back. Um, and I saw what happens to people when they're sick. Uh, anyway, I'd been working with Bob before. He, uh, he'd actually suffered a, a, also a, almost a life-threatening accident like mine. I flew off of a cliff. Um, and uh, and he, I've been working with him on how to fix the physical body through, um, uh, through a type of stretching, myofascial stretching. But with Bob, actually, he's linked a lot of work that he does to how the body interacts with, how the muscles interact with, the organs interact with brain centers, um, and actually about how that's all connected to personality types. And I'm, I think that might be the next big thing that I would work on in my lab. And the big message there, actually, is one, look out for it because it's phenomenal and it excites me. But two, be open-minded to ideas that come from anywhere. Because at first I was like, I'm not sure what he's talking about here, but the stretching is working for me, so I'll do that. Um, but over time, I thought, this man is onto something. The things he's talking about are some of the most interesting things I've ever heard. Um, and so that's, a, that's another thing. And you bring up a lot of really cool points about this kind of data and using that to drive healthcare. And so how is this kind of trend of open data, mm -hmm. how is that going to be changing how we both practice medicine? And what roadblocks are there to doing open data in medicine, especially with genetics? Sure. Um, for open data, I mean, that it, we pushed it very, very hard, but it's really important to not just say, oh, everyone should share data for, data sh you know, like for sharing's sake, because that's not really thinking about all the ways things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And in any system, things can go wrong. You share, you, you collect this data, you spend a lot of time sh collecting it, generating it, working hard for it, you share it, somebody else uses it to patent something, you're done. So you have to create rules by which we share the data. And uh, it's, it's going to be critically, critically important that we do it, it's going to be challenging to figure out how to do it in a way that works, um, but we have to. We need that challenge because otherwise, we'll we can't work fast enough. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you very much. All right.